Many people get bored in marriage, especially if it has lasted more than 10 or 20 years, and this is logical. However, for some reason, people are willing to sacrifice their marriage for quick pleasure only to be followed by darkness. My wife was ready to sacrifice her marriage, but unpleasant consequences awaited her. After two decades of marriage, the 39-year-old mother of my two daughters, whom I adore, informed me that she had plans for a date with a colleague from work tomorrow night. Helen and I got married when we were teenagers. Our courtship lasted less than a year before she became pregnant with our first daughter. Despite the unexpected turn of events, our love was strong, which led us to marry shortly after and welcome Christy into the world just seven months later. Our marriage has been incredibly fulfilling, characterized by love and the joy of raising two wonderful children who love us both very much. I ventured into entrepreneurship, establishing a successful gardening business that blossomed into a multi-million dollar enterprise, allowing us to live a life full of satisfaction and joy. Never in my wildest dreams did I anticipate hearing such words from my wife. Sitting on the couch with a glass of whiskey in hand, her revelation hit me like a freight train. She explained how, since our daughters went to college, she has been battling depression and a sense of unhappiness. In my perception, our marriage was perfect, which made this news particularly devastating. Helen revealed that Tommy from accounting had become a close confidant, supporting her in her struggles with depression, which surprised me. It seemed odd because she had never mentioned feeling depressed or concerned at all. The thought of my wife turning to another man for emotional support was painful, but learning that she wanted to be emotionally involved with him was devastating. It turns out that Tommy Boy has three small daughters and presents himself as a counselor, though in reality he preys on unsuspecting victims, especially married women in vulnerable states. I can't hide this from you, and I hope you understand, but I need to do this for myself. It may seem selfish, but please give me this one night to see how things go, she said. I was filled with rage, wanting to explode, but deep down, I knew my wife well enough to anticipate this. Once she made a decision, there was no turning back. After she finished speaking, I remained motionless, staring at her as she nervously sat on the armchair across from me. The room was filled with an oppressive silence as I refrained from saying a word. Instead, I calmly finished my whiskey, stood up, and walked toward the door. Don't ignore me, stop sulking and acting like a child. This is going to happen, and I had to inform you before proceeding. I would never betray you, and I want you to be fully aware of everything. We've always been honest with each other, and I'm not going to start lying to you now, darling. I stood there looking at her, my expression probably betraying my inner torment. I watched as she hugged her knees and curled up in a ball. Without saying a word, I went upstairs, packed two days worth of clothes and toiletries, and once again, without saying anything, I walked past Helen and out into the garage. She followed, crying and shouting as I passed her. Please, don't go, everything will be fine. It's just a night, nothing more, and it will be over soon. You can give me this after twenty years, can't you? Shaking my head in disbelief at what she had said, I drove off. That Thursday night, I checked into the Ritz-Carlton. Yes, the Ritz-Carlton at $400 per night, but I didn't care. If I was going to endure the pain, I was determined to at least enjoy my accommodations. The calls and messages flooded in immediately, and after sending a response, I blocked her number, informing her that I wouldn't be in touch until I returned home on Saturday. The next day at work, I instructed my secretary to block any calls from my wife and notified security to deny her entry. My plan was already in motion, and I was determined not to let anything interrupt it. I'm John, a man of action. At work and among friends, I'm known as the fixer, the problem solver. People trust me to lead, but at home, I've been the laid-back, accommodating husband, trying to please and distance myself from my assertive personality. This has been my strategy for the last 20 years, but it seems I underestimated its impact. Looking back, I realized that I should have been firmer and more composed in my domestic life. I loved my wife and treated her like a queen, but now I see the consequences. 
I once laughed at a saying that went, treat her like a queen, and she'll treat you like a servant. Now, it's not funny, it's my reality, but I refuse to let it stay that way. On Friday morning, I contacted my brother, a detective in Miami, for help. After explaining my needs, he connected me with one of his associates, Peter Cliff, a private investigator. Peter, this is Sergeant Davis. How are you? Listen, my brother needs your help tonight. I'm asking for a favor. Can you have one of your men follow his wife tonight? We need to identify the person she's meeting with and get as much information as possible by tomorrow morning. Run his plates, get his address and phone number, and send them to me tonight. We'll also need photos of them together, but that can wait until tomorrow. For now, we focus on gathering information about the man. Davis, this is short notice, but I owe you one. I'll do it. So, you want the guy's phone number and address tonight and the rest, photos and information, tomorrow? What do you have for me to start? Yes, that's the plan for now. I'll send you her address, her departure time, and her date's first name. His name is Tommy, and he works with her at Broker Unlimited. It shouldn't be hard to identify him. She gets home at 5 p.m., but we're not sure what time the date is, so you'll need a man stationed outside the house before 5 p.m. to follow her when she leaves. Got it. Send me her address, and I'll take care of the rest for you, buddy. John listened attentively to the conversation, his brother's voice fading as the call ended. A smile formed on his lips. His plan was falling perfectly into place. He was ready to surprise his unfaithful wife. Time was running out, and John's plan required immediate action. While the couple dined, he intended to visit Tommy's wife to tell her the truth about the affair and where her husband currently was. Then, John called his longtime friend Joe to get contact information for the girl's service. Joe, who was going through a difficult divorce, had chosen the easy way to meet his needs, and now John understood that choice. No tricks, just simple transactions that were probably cheaper than dealing with an unfaithful wife. The conversation with Joe was smooth, and he arranged a date with an attractive blonde for the evening. John offered an additional tip of $11,000 due to the unique circumstances explaining his recent breakup and his desire to meet the girl. He emphasized the need for discretion, instructing the escort to maintain the appearance of a sincere encounter in case his wife showed up without revealing her professional status. John anticipated his wife's arrival, fully aware that she might catch him in bed with someone else. If she was seeking a rendezvous with another man, he was prepared to match her actions with a touch of class. They had agreed to meet at his hotel for drinks and to get to know each other before moving on to the night's activities. As a real estate professional, Helen organized open houses every Saturday and rarely returned home before 6 p.m. Saturdays were her busiest days, and this one was no exception. Reflecting on Thursday night when Helen asserted her independence, John, after her departure, sat on the couch, venting his frustration to an empty room. I can't believe she behaved so immaturely, walking out without saying a word. What an idiot. Helen tried reaching out to John through calls and messages, becoming increasingly irritated by his lack of response until a specific message mentioning betrayal stopped her in her tracks. It made her reconsider her plans, initially viewing the date as offensive fun rather than infidelity. She pushed thoughts of betrayal aside, convincing herself that it was just one night of enjoyment. John will have to accept it, and we'll get back to normal. He's overreacting, but he'll forgive me, and I'll make it up to him tomorrow night. He won't be able to resist, and I know exactly how to help him move past this. On Friday night, after returning to an empty house, she reconsidered her plans once again. Should she go through with her date with Tommy or cancel and invite John back home for what could be a pleasant evening? She decided to stick with her original intentions. She indulged in a relaxing bath, carefully shaved her legs, applied her most seductive lotion, and settled at her vanity, transforming her charming face into that of a seductress. Gazing at her alluring reflection in the mirror, she smiled with satisfaction as she finished styling her long hair. 
After removing the tags from the delightful short dress, she hung it on the mirror. Then, she slipped into stockings she had never worn for John, adjusting them to a new garter belt she had bought at Neiman Marcus that day. As she ran her hands over the stockings, memories flooded her mind, those times when John had asked her to dress provocatively. Guilt overwhelmed her as she recalled Valentine's Day when John brought home a set of Victoria's secret lingerie. She vividly remembered the pain in his eyes when she questioned whether he thought she was promiscuous and refused to wear the outfit. For more than a minute, she stood frozen, thinking about the stockings and garter belt she had bought, which she was now going to wear for another man. This reflection caused her to think, for the first time, about cancelling the date and ending the relationship. She couldn't shake the echo of John's accusations of betrayal from her mind. However, she quickly pushed aside the guilt, justifying her actions by thinking she was giving something to her companion that she had never given to John. She slipped into a silk dress, buttoned it up, and decided not to wear a bra, pleased with the result. Standing in front of a full-length mirror, she admired her long legs and black stockings and high heels. Oh my god, I look quite daring. But it's so exciting. I can't wait to see Tommy's reaction. Even though she tried to convince herself that this was just a date and nothing more, deep down she knew she had to suppress her desires. For the past month, she had eagerly anticipated her date with Tommy, her mind consumed by the excitement. Despite her husband's immature behavior, she was determined to enjoy herself. Helen believed John would give in as he always did, appreciating his compliant nature. She loved him for that. Just as she was preparing for the night, John made one last call, offering her a final chance, hoping to stop the impending disaster and save their marriage. Though swallowing his pride was difficult, his love for Helen was still deep. Willing to sacrifice his dignity to win her back, he begged her to reconsider, ready to endure the humiliation to keep her from going on the date. Anxious and guilty, Helen answered John's call, aware of his less than honorable intentions. Despite feeling conflicted, she longed for his understanding and acceptance. If I'm failing, tell me and I'll fix it. I just want to be with you. You can cancel this date and save our marriage. Please. Helen listened as his voice trembled. She felt a pang of sympathy for him, but he seemed weak and pathetic, her strong, dependable man reduced to tears and begging, which gave her an unexpected sense of control. She understood his love for her, certain that John would forgive her once he understood. Their shared history, their children, and their affection were powerful bonds that ensured they would remain together indefinitely. John, I adore you more than you can imagine, and I long for our future together. However, tonight I must go through with this, regardless of our love. It's a passing indulgence for me, unrelated to our relationship. Please understand and allow me this one occasion, and I promise you I'll be yours forever. I know you're hurting, and I'm sorry, but you're overreacting. It's simply dinner and drinks with a friend, nothing more. Nothing will happen, and I'll return home tonight, devoted to you forever. You'll understand once it's over. We'll talk tomorrow, and you can claim me as your wife. With tears in her eyes, she longed to hang up but heard her husband's final plea before disconnecting the call. Wiping her eyes carefully to avoid smudging her makeup, she looked in the mirror and spoke to her reflection. He probably thinks I'm being unreasonable, but John, I'm sorry. I have to do this for myself. Please don't be angry. Adjusting her hair, touching up her lipstick, and spraying perfume, she tried to push thoughts of John out of her mind. In his hotel room, John listened to the end of the call and stared at his phone, wiping his eyes as the anger took hold again. He had just pleaded with his wife not to go on the date, but she insisted it would happen and that he had to understand and be supportive. Overwhelmed with pain, he realized he had lost the woman he had loved and been with for the last twenty years. Across the street from his house, Peter, the investigator, sat in his white van just before 5 p.m., watching as John entered the garage. An hour later, he noticed another car pull into the driveway. After noting the license plate and making some calls, Peter quickly relayed the requested information to Davis. 
The phone number and address were sent to both John's and Peter's phones even before the couple left for their date. As Tommy entered the house, he noticed the sadness in Helen's eyes and recognized her moment of insecurity and guilt. Familiar with such situations, he knew he had to act quickly and knew exactly what to say. Helen, what's bothering you? You seem so upset. Tommy, maybe we shouldn't go through with this. I've been thinking about John and how he asked me not to go out with you. I feel so guilty, like I've already betrayed him, she confessed with a tear rolling down her cheek. Tommy quickly sat on the couch and embraced Helen, using his experience to address her concerns. It took him about an hour, but being skilled with women and their emotions, he was determined to change her decision. He enjoyed the challenge. Everything's okay, Helen. We don't have to go through with this, and I completely understand your reservations. You've never gone out alone before, not even for a simple dinner or movie. He just doesn't understand that we're only friends. Men like him want to protect their wives from any perceived threat, but if he understood how much I value our friendship, I'm sure he wouldn't oppose it. Honestly, I'm disappointed we can't spend the evening together, but I understand. John was really looking forward to spending time with you and trying out that new restaurant. But hey, here's an idea. Why don't we have a nice dinner together, and then I'll take you home. I'm sure he wouldn't mind you having dinner with a friend. Tommy's casual attitude persuaded Helen that dinner would be fine, especially since she was already dressed, and secretly, she wanted it. At 7 p.m., Peter watched as the couple headed to a downtown restaurant, quickly informing John of their whereabouts. He kept them updated throughout the evening, easily capturing photos during the next four hours. Peter took pictures of them dining, holding hands, entering a dance club, dancing intimately, kissing, and acting as if they were deeply in love. He also recorded videos of them dancing slowly, with Tommy touching her inappropriately on the dance floor. Peter sent all the material before dawn the next day. At exactly 8 p.m., John called Helen's father, Brian, with whom he had been close friends and golf buddies for years, to deliver the bad news. Hey Brian, it's John. Hey John, are we still scheduled for golf on Sunday? I'm not sure, Brian, but I've got some bad news. Your daughter is currently out on a date with a colleague. I thought everything was fine between us, but she expressed the need for something more and decided to see this man. You know I care a lot about your family, but I can't tolerate this behavior, and I see our marriage is over. She has violated our marriage vows, and I can't forgive her. I just wanted you to understand the circumstances behind what's going to happen. I'm sorry it has to end this way. John, are you saying she's seeing someone else? Are you sure? That doesn't sound like my daughter. Brian, I have a private investigator watching them at dinner right now. She's with him as we speak. She's betraying me, our marriage, and our children. I'm sorry, this is hard for me, but I respect you, and I felt you should know the truth. John, I'm so sorry. Please don't do anything rash. I think she loves you, and maybe the two of you can work this out. I'm sorry, Brian, but I've reached my limit. I'll call you soon. Let's reschedule for next Sunday. It looks like this weekend is turning out to be pretty awful. Afterward, John headed to Tommy's house armed with the address given by the private investigator. When he met Estella, Tommy's wife, he noticed her confusion when he asked if she was Mrs. Bro, the mother of three. Dressed in tight jeans and a lace top that accentuated her figure, she greeted him at the door and made a concerted effort to maintain eye contact and avoid any awkwardness. Are you Mrs. Bro, Tommy's wife? John asked. Yes, is everything okay with him, she replied. He's in good hands, believe me. He works with my wife. May I come in for a moment? Once inside, John delivered the news to Estella. Mrs. Bro, I regret to inform you that, right now, your husband Tommy and my soon-to-be ex-wife are on a date. Yesterday, my wife informed me she felt the need to explore new horizons, and your husband, in his kindness, became the recipient of her attention. 
Are you sure you've got the right person? My Tommy is currently at his Friday night card game. Mrs. Bro, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't certain. My private investigator is watching them right now. I'll provide you with photos and videos as evidence, but I felt you needed to be informed. It pained John to leave her crying, knowing this affair would likely ruin her marriage, but that was the choice Tommy made. On Saturday morning, as John had breakfast, he settled in and poured a cup of the hotel's signature coffee. The aroma was delightful, offering some comfort as he reclined. The betrayal of his wife brought tears to his eyes as he watched footage of them kissing, Tommy's hand resting on her behind, shattering any hope of reconciliation in his mind. He also noticed she had worn stockings for her lover, remembering her reaction when he gave her the same gift a few months ago. Her betrayal and disrespect were unbearable for him. Overwhelmed by humiliation and a sense of inadequacy, his emotions eventually turned back into anger. Tommy persuaded Helen to extend their evening after dinner, inviting her to join him at his favorite dance club. Later, it became clear that this decision had a detrimental effect on her marriage. Although she had doubts before accepting, she gave in to the desire to experience this one night. John was gripped by a deep sadness unlike anything he had ever felt before. Watching the video for the third time, he could not suppress his pain when he saw Tommy's inappropriate behavior, causing him to exclaim in frustration to no one in particular. Reflecting on everything, he concluded that, although his wife might not have physically cheated, her actions were still unacceptable, disrespectful, and represented a profound betrayal of their marriage. At 2 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, John met Candy at the hotel, and for the next two hours, they got to know each other better. John made his intentions clear, finding Candy to be the ideal partner for his scheme. A little after 4 p.m., they returned to his residence, and by 5 p.m., they were already cuddled up in bed. Before turning in for the night, John strategically placed a note he had composed for Helen. It read, Helen, by breaking our marriage vows and contract last night, you not only destroyed our union, but also broke my heart. From this point forward, I no longer consider us married. Legally, yes, but our contract is void, granting both of us the freedom to pursue our desires. I will take the master bedroom, as this is my home. You are welcome in any other room, but not in my bed. Your belongings are in the guest rooms. Please respect my personal space. You have gained your freedom, and now I claim mine. I trust you will find comfort in your decisions and in your new life. Sincerely, your former husband. He removed his wedding ring and placed it on top of the letter at the front door, securing it with one of his collectible knives, driving the blade through both the letter and the wooden door. This display would greet Helen upon her return later that evening. At around 10 p.m., when Helen returned from work, she noticed the knife stuck in the door, causing immediate concern. Such a sight would undoubtedly disturb anyone. She cautiously approached the door, scanning her surroundings for other signs of disturbance. As she got closer, she saw a note addressed to her, accompanied by John's wedding ring. Her heart raced, and tears streamed down her face as she absorbed the contents of the letter. Gripping the ring and note tightly, she rushed inside, desperately searching for John to express her desire for him not to leave her. Through sobs, she called out his name in the dark hallway. The house was silent except for a few noises coming from the bedroom. Ascending the stairs, she paused to listen at the door. Upon opening it, she found her husband in bed with another woman, enjoying themselves together. Helen was consumed by rage, unleashing her fury upon her husband. How dare you! You are despicable, she screamed before storming out of the house. Filled with anger and tears, she drove to her sister Mary's house. Once there, and after calming down, she told Mary how she had found her husband in bed with another woman and how lost she felt. Her sister tried to console and calm her down. That doesn't sound like John at all. I never would have imagined he'd betray you. He always seemed so deeply devoted to you, showing more love and respect than anyone I know. I even envied the affection he showed you. This doesn't make sense. 
Did something else happen? What do you think caused this? Helen, tears running down her face, murmured, I'm not sure. Maybe it's because I went on a date last night. That's the only explanation I can think of. What do you mean, you went on a date? With who? Just a colleague from work. It wasn't romantic. Just dinner and dancing. Sister, let me get this straight. You went out with someone else last night, had dinner and danced while leaving your husband alone at home. Am I understanding this correctly? Well, yes, but you're making it sound worse than it was. You're out of your mind. Did you really think he would be okay with you going out with someone else? Helen handed Mary the note that had been on the door. Oh, Helen, you've really messed things up this time. Your actions were selfish and foolish. They may have cost you your husband and your marriage. You can stay here tonight, but tomorrow you need to face him and try to fix things. I'll reach out to him later and ask him to talk, but I'm not optimistic. Be prepared for the worst, sister. If I were in your position, my husband would have kicked me out without a second thought and John is even more devoted than Tom. Helen spent the night alone in Mary's guest room, crying into the early hours with little sleep. Mary sent a message to John, urging him to call back immediately. John, always fond of Mary and aware of her intentions, returned the call. Hey, Mary, what's going on? Hi, John. My foolish sister is here and explained everything that happened at your house tonight. I don't blame you at all, and I have to admit your response was pretty quick, she said with a chuckle. John replied, well, you know me, Mary. I don't tolerate nonsense. Look, I understand she made a mistake, but she's really struggling right now and I can't handle her in this state. You both need to have a conversation about this tomorrow. I'm not sure if you're really going to throw her out and I wouldn't blame you if you did. But if things haven't gone too far with this guy, maybe you should consider trying to work things out. Perhaps therapy or some kind of treatment for Helen to address her issues. Anyway, please let her come back and talk tomorrow. John responded, of course, she can come back. This is still her home and I haven't thrown her out. However, she won't be staying with me while she's here. I'm not angry or upset anymore. My anger has been replaced by a deep sense of pain due to her betrayal. I'll let her talk, but I can't promise anything about the future right now. I feel as much hate for this woman as I do love, and the pain is dictating my emotions. It would take a miracle for me to consider taking her back, but you know that you are the smart one in the family. Oh God, I can't believe my sister thought you'd be okay with her going out with another guy. What an idiot. Be patient. Just know that she loves you. I hope she hasn't gone too far with that idiot she was with. Tell her to come home when she's ready. Goodbye, Mary. You're my favorite, you know that, right? I love you, John. Goodbye. On Sunday at noon, after returning from the gym, I found Helen's car in the driveway and her sitting at the kitchen table, trying to smile. You know we're not heading for divorce. We can fix this because we love each other, she said. I stayed silent, poured a cup of coffee, and sat down across from Helen, who nervously rubbed her hands in her lap. After a few sips, I looked her in the eye and finally spoke. That's fine with me, Helen. Divorce or not, it's irrelevant now because once you broke our marriage vows, our marriage ended. I no longer see us as a couple and you're free to date whoever you want, just like I am. The only change is that you won't sleep in my bed and we won't be intimate. That ended the night you went on your date. John, he's not my boyfriend and nothing happened. Helen, you went on a date with another man while married. You dressed provocatively, had dinner, held hands, allowed him to touch you inappropriately, and spent time with him. That's the problem. For you, it may be insignificant, but for me, it's everything. That's what ended our marriage. So, if you want to stay married, fine, but I don't want a divorce. I don't want a divorce either. Just give us time and I'll come back to your bed. 
But you had a relationship with that woman you were with and I won't tolerate that. I burst out laughing and exclaimed, wow, how funny. You're the one who broke our marriage agreement, not me. You abandoned our marriage the moment you agreed to go out with another man.